Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. So the, today's topic is are spheres, or actually, strictly speaking, not. We'll see what I mean. Um, so I would like to explain what island backward lane spaces are. And I kind of haven't really made up my mind whether I should like them or not. They're pretty cool, as you will see uh, abstractly, so for abstract reasons, but in practice, they might be a little bit strange. So I would try to motivate why they exist, um, and then I will show you some examples why they're a little bit uh, weird in nature. Um, so it all starts with <laughs> the usual problem in homotopy. So homotopy groups are just ridiculously hard. They're just ridiculously hard. So here is my table, well, it's not my table, it's a table of the homotopy groups of spheres. So in this direction, you have the pi n's or the pi k's increasing, and in this direction, you have the s n's. So if you would like to know something like uh, pi 9 of S11, you would look here and you would see a zero. Okay, very good. Um, and as you can see, in particular to the northeast corner of this thing, you see kind of kind of a little bit strange things turning up. So here, for example, that's pi 14 of, let me see, uh, pi 14 of S4 is apparently Z2 cross Z12 cross Z120. And I have no idea where those numbers come from. And I'm not the only one. So it's kind of pretty random. So in, in this direction, so in the northeast direction, this is pretty random nonsense. It's kind of almost random. Um, there are some patterns in particular in this direction. So you can see a lot of zeros in this part here. But the upper part is, is pretty crazy. Shocking statement. Not even um, the row for S2 is known. So not even the, the you know, at least not right now. And I don't expect it. I, I shouldn't say anything, but I, I don't expect it to, uh, that, that there will be a breakthrough very, very soon. And we know all the homotopy groups of S2. Uh, right now, we just don't. So even this column here, the S2 column, so this one here is, is just, this was a really bad one. So this one here is, um, it's not known, which I think kind of it's really, really shocking, right? S2, it's S2. We should really know homotopy groups of S2, but we don't. Um, I'm not saying you can't compute them up to a certain point, but there's no general formula or something like that. And they are only were only computed up to, I haven't checked the latest results in the literature, but something around 60 or so. So uh, pi 60 of, of S2 might be known. But of course, this is just, I don't know. Um, at one point, it just, it just seems to get pretty hopeless. So they're, they're really, they're not known. And there are only very, very few results. Um, for example, in this row, you can actually show a link into the description, a very surprising statement, in my opinion, um, that um, it's trivial if you would spell trivial correct. So um, pi n of S2 is trivial, if and only if n is 1. So at least you could say something like that there are no, no other zeros in, in this funny uh, row here. And it seems to be like a hopeless question. So we are talking about spheres, right? Is there any space that is easier than a sphere, which is not completely trivial? So point certainly is easier than a sphere. Anything else? And eh, not really, right? So this seems to be a hopeless question. Um, is there any space for which we know all pies? Mm. That sounds pretty hopeless to me, just looking at the um, table of homotopy groups of spheres. Turns out that there are, and these spaces, of course, have to have some importance because they are kind of in between a point and a sphere, if you want, from the viewpoint of homotopy. Um, and the idea is as follows. So homotopy groups, and it's again Whitehead theorem, are kind of determined, uh, determined cell complexes uh, in, in, a, in a certain very strict sense. They're not really determinant, they have the weak homotopy equivalent or whatever, but basically, um, the idea is whenever you have a space and it's a nice space like a cell complex and you know the, the homotopy groups of the space, um, then you know the space. That's only not quite true. Um, so Whitehead theorem is not quite saying that, but let's let's just go with it and just, just think that it's a statement of Whitehead theorem. So for now, this just let's just approximate Whitehead theorem and just think, oh yeah, that's a statement. So here's an example. Um, so here's a space. And it's really easy to see that the homotopy groups of the space, um, so this is kind of a convex set in what is it, R2 probably. Um, and this space is 
as only trivial homotopy groups, and yeah, it's homotopy equivalent for a point. And something like that is true in general, right? So that's kind of the statement of Whitehead's theorem. In particular, Whitehead's theorem is a statement that um, about weak homotopy equivalences, those are, those are the ones that induce isomorphisms on homology. And kind of the problem always in Whitehead theorem is that if you have a very widely spread homology, you kind of need to induce isomorphisms everywhere. So if you have infinitely many isomorphisms that need to be induced. And that's just, just rarely happens unless you, of course, have a homotopy equivalent already. A much better chance for this to happen would be if almost everything is zero, because if almost everything is zero, um, most maps need to be zero anyway, and you only have a few, few little points where something might happen. So um, there's a good chance, this is in some sense very, very true um, for spaces with concentrated homology, uh, homotopy. And what I mean by that is something like, um, there's only one pi k that is relevant and the rest is trivial. Well, kind of the idea that started this uh, looking for those eilenberg Lane spaces. Um, they were not called eilenberg Lane spaces to begin with. They were introduced by Eilenberg and McLean um, is to focus first on cell complexes, otherwise this is hopeless anyway. And second, on cell complexes, which almost all pies are trivial. Kind of makes sense from this point of view of Whitehead theorem. And we actually do know example of those spaces. Um, if, from the fundamental group, which is of course pi one. So here is an example. So here we have S1, of course, and it has a fundamental, uh, it has a universal cover R. And whenever you know that, there's a kind of general statement, um, which is uh, very nice, actually. So whenever you know that, for any universal cover, the universal cover has the same higher homotopy groups, so from two onwards, as your original space. And this, in my example here, of course, just says because R is a point, right? So R is contractible, that the higher homotopy groups of S1 are actually trivial. And this is exactly why we actually do know this row here. So this row is the one with a lot of zeros. The row above it is the row for the point, so S0 or whatever. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all very exciting anyway. But for S1, this argument actually shows that higher homotopy groups are all zero. Right? So you just look at the universal cover, the higher homotopy groups are determined on the universal cover, and the universal cover is R, so you're done. Right? In particular, this implies whenever you have a space whose universal cover is a point, then we have concentrated homotopy. Right? So for example, for my S1 here, there's just concentrated homotopy in the fundamental group itself. All other homotopies are uh, ze uh, zero. And those spaces have a specific name uh, they are called KG1 spaces. So G here is, in this case, the pi one of your space. And the one here refers to the one of pi one, of course. Turns out that the description of those spaces really generalizes. So here's a statement, these are the island berg lane spaces. And as we will see, or as you can already see on this slide, to satisfy universal property that I'm going to uh, comment on in a second. But this is how it works. For any N in G, slight catch, I only allow a billion G for N bigger than one because higher homotopy groups are a billion. But anyway, for any N in G, there exists a cell complex, which is usually denoted by KGN, which has this universal type property or this very concentrated hom homotopy here, which says, um, so very concentrated homotopy, which is G in pi N. So you pick N and G and it's G in pi N and it's zero other. Okay, so there exists a cell complex, kind of the pointiest existence, cell complex concentrated homology. And as I said before, they kind of satisfy this universal type of property, which I summarize in those two points. So um, first, you, it's what universal type, so you should prove existence and uniqueness. Um, so it can be combinatorially constructed from G if it exists. So it's a very nice procedure, which I'm not going to explain, but it's linked in the description that or it, it Hatcher, for example, that they grew in um, cells according to G to kind of kill off higher homotopy groups. Um, so it's existing statement, a very combinatorial construction. Um, and it turns out that there's a uniqueness statement as well. So for every cell complex that satisfies exactly the same kind of type of properties, uh, this cell complex needs to be homotopy equivalent to your uh, island backpack lane space, which is kind of a cool statement, right? They are really determined uh, up to homotopy. 
this kind of fool exists and that determined up to homotopy, which is absolutely not trivial. Uh, just think about the crazy homotopy groups of spheres. And that's not just it there, of course. I mean, this is kind of a universal type object, so it should have some importance somewhere. And the most striking one is that you can use it to represent the functor uh, Hn. Uh, cohomology, not homology, but it represents cohomology with um, well values in your group, whatever that means. It represents a factor, so it kind of knows all information of um, this, this um, cohomology, which is pretty pretty surprising. So in some sense, you don't want it to be a sphere because it's kind of a strange statement. Um, yeah, so spheres definitely don't encode all information of cohomology for all spaces, right? This just a little bit over the top, I guess. The only catch here is the following. So I'm back with lane spaces. And as I said before, I haven't really made up my mind whether I should like them or not, but they're a universal type of object. So in some sense, I'm supposed to like them, but they're a little bit crazy in practice. That's kind of the problem. So how I would like to think about it is um, so something like in analysis, there's something that are called elementary functions and we all know them. So that's actually a definition of an elementary function, but whatever. So think of polynomials, rational functions, trigonometric functions, sine, cosines, whatever, exponential functions, something like that. So some elementary functions. So kind of the basic pieces you will always see in all examples, and you will should always look first. Uh, that's well, well, the elementary function analysis. They're very, very important. And you're always very, very distressed or disappointed, or it will get very messy if one of your functions is not a monkey. So in the topology, you have some, well, elementary functions of topology, something like spheres, tori, projective spaces, manifolds, something like that. And whenever you're outside of this class of spaces, things get a bit weird and a bit strange. And the problem is, so this is, of course, the exponential function, of course, uh, the, the, the elementary function, if you want, maybe the elementary function, some constant function, but whatever, a very famous example. So elementary, this is of course easy, right? That's the point. Elementary functions are easy. The elementary topological spaces are easy. And it turns out that most of them are not Eilenberg related spaces. And even worse, most Eilenberg related spaces are not of this form. So for pi one, so whenever your entry is one, it's actually not so bad. So I've listed some examples here. I already discussed this one. So S1 is the Eilenberg lane space for Z, because of course pi one of Z is uh, uh, pi one of S1 is Z, and the higher homotopy would vanish. A little bit less obvious is for Z mod two, you would get a projective space. Okay, an infinite projective space, but anyway, it's a projective space. And you can many three many folds actually appear uh, where where G would be the fundamental group of your three many folds. Many, many, many more. So it's for, for, for pi one, it's actually for the fundamental group, it's actually pretty nice. And for higher homotopy groups, I don't have any good examples. So uh, it turns out that there's only one that I basically know, seen as an elementary function. Of course, you could construct new examples from those, but that's not what I want to do. I would kind of like to see them as elementary functions. And I only really know one example. So uh, KZ2 is CP infinity. And I don't know any, any other examples. So in some sense, um, those spaces are not among the elementary functions of topology, which is a little bit bad. So they're kind of ill-behaved. It's in some sense said because they control cohomology here, but maybe it's also in some sense expected because they control cohomology and cohomology is certainly not nothing really trivial. Anyway, so let me summarize. So Eilenberg and Lane spaces, kind of this universal type construction of spaces with very concentrated homotopy uh, groups, maybe just one, and they're really determined by the homotopy groups. The only problem I, I personally see is that uh, most Eilenberg related spaces are pretty pretty strange from the viewpoint of the elementary functions of topology. Anyway, I hope you like elementary functions of topology. I certainly do. I also hope you like the video, and I hope to see you next time.